About 20 years ago, I uh, began to have some problems with my eyesight and had uh, a doctor here locally check me out and then uh, referred me to an ophthalmologist. And uh, to make a long story short, I ended up going to a specialist in Florida and there uh, he determined that I needed cataract surgery. You know, things weren't in focus and uh, in my eyesight and so um, I secured a few days where I flew down uh, to the Tampa Bay area and I had one eye done one day, another eye done the next day, the third day I flew home. So one eye is for uh, near sight, one eye is for far sight. Uh, so when I can read my notes, the other one I can see far away. I don't know how the brain makes that happen, but it took a few days to adjust and it did. But it was absolutely amazing when I got back how everything that I thought was in focus wasn't because I was able to see more clearly. You know, there are many lives that are out of focus today. And it's important that we ask the question why. Some people may think their lives are in focus, but if we really take a hard look, we were able to see that it's not. Maybe you do realize that your life is not in focus. Why is that? Well, it could be because of COVID-19 that, man, I'm telling you, it's really hurt a lot of people. It's affected so many. And we're hearing more and more uh, issues related to COVID-19. But there are also other reasons why our lives get out of focus. It could be because of pride. Our attitude is, it's beneath me to serve in that way. Or it might be because you're selfish. I don't want to share. It might be because of arrogance. It's all about me. You're caring about you. And you don't care about anybody else. It might be because you're wounded. You're in great pain emotionally. Maybe it's because you've been rejected. Oh, I tried that once. Never trying that again. Maybe it's because you're suffering physically and you're saying to yourself, I need relief. Maybe it's because of wrong influence that your life is out of focus. There are those who have influenced you in a wrong way. You've been conditioned by others. Or it might simply be because of sin that you're in darkness and you can't see the truth. And so your life is out of focus. The disciples... Uh, their lives were constantly out of focus. In fact, I want to give you a great example, maybe the best example of how their lives were out of focus in Matthew chapter 20. And I want to begin reading in verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. That's James and John. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that <clears throat> these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Now let me stop for a minute there. In chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus had just said that in his messianic age that is to come, that he's going to sit on his throne, and he told the disciples that they were going to sit on their thrones and rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. And so with that statement that Jesus has made, she's caught up into who's going to sit next to Jesus. So she wants one son to sit on one side and the other son to sit on the other side of Jesus. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it belongs to those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave." Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, how do you get your life back into focus? Well, Jesus gives the answer. It's by caring for others. Caring refocuses your life. Now, someone cared for me physically. 
They were able to help me to get my eyesight into focus. And maybe there's somebody who's come along in your life and they helped you in some specific way to help you get your life back into focus. Well, we need to do the same. And especially, we need to be sensitive to those around us who need their lives refocused spiritually. Now, how does that happen? Notice several things. First of all, caring is understanding God's mission. Caring is understanding God's mission. God's mission is about the cross. Here we see that these disciples misunderstood the kingdom of God. They thought it was political. Jesus is trying to explain to them that it is spiritual. His kingdom is your heart. And Jesus redirects the way that they're thinking by referring them to a cup. It is the cup of suffering. It is the cup of sacrifice. Notice verse 22. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Now, the word you there is a plural word, and he's specifically speaking to James and John and their mother. He's trying to help all three of them understand. Of course, the other disciples are hearing this, but he wants them to understand exactly that, in essence, you don't know what you're talking about. You say that you're willing to take that cup, but you have no idea what it is. And Jesus is going to show them in the, in the few days to come of what that really is all about. So Jesus is asking them and he's asking us, are you prepared to face your cross? God's mission is about the cross and God's mission is about people. And he says that in two ways, Jesus did in the New Testament. He talks about the Great Commission, that we are to go and to make disciples. That's about evangelism. It's about salvation, leading people to saving faith in Christ And it's also about discipling them, helping them grow in that newfound faith. But also, he talks about a great commandment in just a few chapters later, in Matthew chapter 20 and chapter 22, he talks about the greatest commandment being to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And he says the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So you have this great commission of going out and helping people come to know Christ and grow in their faith. But then the great commandment is that we go and we love others, we serve others, we care for others. Now notice caring is understanding also your position, specifically your leadership position in influencing others. They desire to be leaders in Jesus' kingdom. They had a certain view of that, that's a political leader, uh, having authority over someone. But Jesus, again, redirects their thinking. Jesus explains, not first, but last. Notice verse 16. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. He also helped them, not highest, but lowest. Verse 26. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Notice what else he said. Not served, but serve. Verse 28, Jesus as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You also need to understand not just your position, but your leadership style. And here he helps us understand that we're to be a servant leader. Now that was a radical concept in the Roman Empire. Theirs was about dominion, dominating somebody, authoritarianism, lording authority over someone and the Jews had the same idea that's the way they were practicing their style of leadership as they ruled over and Jesus explains that in the context of these verses that I read to you about the role of the Jews and how they were really more political than they were spiritual and how they served or how they helped other people and Jesus says that a leader must become a servant He must become a slave. So what Jesus is doing is empowering others rather than demanding power. Now, what are you doing? Are you empowering others or are you demanding power as somebody who's using that authority over someone else? Now, look, our our world needs to see servant leaders. Our world is so confused about what a true leader is. Uh, I, I don't have time to really get into just the, so many examples we're seeing right now 
in our country today. But if you look at, go down uh, in history, you'll see that the greatest leaders were those who had a servant's heart, who really cared about people. D.A. Carson says this, One of the ironies of language is that a word like minister, which in its roots refers to helper, one who ministers, has become a badge of honor and power in religion and politics. We use the word a minister in a political way or minister in a spiritual way. And in, in some cases, it just simply means somebody who has authority or power, not somebody who is a servant leader. Now, also, we need to understand our leadership example. Of course, there's no greater example, as we see here once again, than Jesus Christ. Verse 28, he says he did not come to be served, but to serve. He also said in John 15, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Now, along with that, we need to understand the leadership qualities of Jesus. This really is more practical in understanding what I'm trying to say in the way in which we are to serve others. As we look at these qualities of Christ. So let me list a few of those. So many, but just a handful. First of all, Jesus remained focused on his purpose, regardless of his situation. He recognized that God was always with him. Remember in the wilderness? Well, actually, he was baptized, and then he's going into the wilderness for 40 days of prayer and fasting. The Bible says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness, knowing that he was going to be tempted by Satan. So we need to have an attitude that we're going to follow the leading of God's Spirit wherever it is that he leads us. Because when we're in the battle, when we're in the suffering, when we don't understand life isn't focused like we think it ought to be, that we need to remember that God has gone before us. He's leading into circumstances. He's allowing circumstances to happen to teach us something about him and about us that will benefit our life and the kingdom of God and what he's trying to accomplish by using us in his eternal mission. Notice also he did not allow his personal needs to get in the way of God's purpose. That was first and foremost. What is your purpose, not my need? He did not allow other opportunities to distract him. Satan tried to test him with other opportunities. And all along his life's journey, uh, in the three years of ministry, there are people always trying to distract him to another way, trying to do something else. But Jesus stayed focused on, the, on what God was calling him to do. And he did not allow popular opinion to sway him. This is what everybody else is saying. Jesus did not allow that to happen. He stayed focused. He let God's purpose, God's mission determine what he was going to do. Notice also, Jesus challenged people to move from where they are to where they need to be. Great example of that is in Mark chapter 10 with the rich young ruler or the rich young man. And here he says, ask Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus says, you know the commandments, and he lists them. And the man says, well, I've done all those. And Jesus says, yes, you have done all those. But he says, what you need to do is you need to sell everything that you have and follow me. And the man walked away disappointed, the Bible says. Now, Jesus is not asking all of us to sell what we have when we become a Christian in order to follow him. But what he was doing, he knew what was holding this man back. And he took him where he was, and he tried to help him get to where he needed to be. And that was the step that man needed to take in order to get there. So we need to be helping others <clears throat> understand this is where you are, but this is where you need to be. And what is that next step that will help them get to where God wants them to be in their lives? So Jesus was a master at doing that. So many examples of people he encountered and how he took them where they were and he led them to the next place that's what I love about the gospel is that God comes to us as we are he invites us into relationship as we are we don't have to do all these things in order for God to accept us he just takes us as sinners broken people and he says if you'll follow me 
I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you a great life, an eternal life. And so that's what Jesus did. And that's what we need to do. We need to take people where they are and help them move. Also, Jesus mentored others so they could reach their full potential. And the, a, a great way that he demonstrated that mentoring even while he was on the cross. He demonstrated love. He expressed the greatest love anyone could ever imagine. A sinless man who was willing, who chose to die on the cross to save those who were sinful. He died for the sins of the world. He also demonstrated forgiveness. He spoke genuine words of forgiveness to those who wronged him without being bitter. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Well, I tell you, that attitude can help you stay so focused. And when, we're, when we have bitterness, it gets you out of focus so quickly. And so when you've been wrong, when you've been hurt, remember the words of Jesus while he hung on a cross. Father, forgive them. He stayed focused. That helped him stay focused. Also, Jesus' humility. He had the power to call the angelic host to take him off the cross. But he stayed humble and he stayed obedient to God's will. And he demonstrated mercy while he was on the cross. He threw the thief on the cross. One mocked Jesus. One acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus showed him mercy. And we need to have that same attitude as we're investing in the lives of others as we're mentoring them, we need to show mercy. We need to understand, hey, this is where they are. They're not where I might be in my, in my spiritual maturity, but I need to remember I was once there. And so I need to take the time and the mercy that is needed to help them move forward. And again, of course, he demonstrated obedience before he got to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but your will be done. We also see in the qualities of Christ that he led by example. John chapter 13, we find Jesus in the upper room. I, I don't know if there's another example that better demonstrates the servant leadership quality of Christ other than the cross than this scene. And it's in this scene that Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Just imagine for a moment being in a room and the disciples are sitting there, and then Jesus goes to each one of them, and he stoops down, and he washes their feet. Now, this is the Messiah. This is their leader. This is the Son of God. They should have been washing his feet every day, not in day. But Jesus stoops down and washes their feet. Again, think about where your heart is, your mind. Am I expecting people to wash my feet? Or am I willing to wash their feet? He led by example. If we say we're a servant leader, what, what are you doing to demonstrate that? What specific step have you taken the last week or two weeks of showing somebody the love of Christ by the way that you have loved them. Now, here's what Jesus said after he washed their feet. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that this was a sacrament. This is something that we ought to do uh, on a regular basis. But he was talking about Maybe there is a time that we need to do that, but it's the attitude of the heart of serving somebody else. He led by example. We need to lead by example. Jesus also was balanced in the way that he responded to people, how he helped people. Somebody says, well, I treat everybody the same. Well, that's not going to work because not everybody is the same, and their need is not the same. Jesus responded to people based on the situation and based on the specific need that they had. Peter, what did he do with Peter? Well, first of all, Jesus rebuked Peter, but then he restored Peter. 
And he restored Peter at the perfect time and the perfect place and in front of the right people. Peter needed to be restored. He needed to experience a conversation and the love of Christ in order to continue the mission that Jesus had placed on his life. John chapter 21. I want to encourage you to read that. It's a great scene of how Jesus is unique in his approach of serving Peter. But then the woman that's caught in adultery. Jesus was very specific in the way that he responded to her need. The woman at the well, Nicodemus, whoever it might be, Jesus was very unique. Mary and Martha, how he responded to each of them differently. All all those needs, Jesus was unique. And so we need to understand, again, where people are. And if we understand where they are and the need that's holding them back, then we're able to help them take that specific step so that they can move forward in their journey of faith. And then notice that Jesus persevered until his mission was complete. One of the characteristics of servant leaders is that they finish the job. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So caring for others is understanding your position, knowing that we are to be servant leaders and to follow the master example, Jesus Christ, the way that he did it. That's how we should do it. Now notice finally, caring is understanding others' condition. Jesus said that he gave his life a ransom for many. Now, what is their condition? Well, they're in spiritual bondage. Jesus is using slavery language here, bondage language. They're enslaved to sin and to death. They need to be redeemed. They need to be ransomed. That's the word he uses. They also need to experience God's love. Now, Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8. Verse 1 through 3. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus, because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What the law could not do, since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in flesh like ours under sin's domain and as a sin offering. Paul says in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. They also need to experience our love, not just God's love, but our love so that they can then understand God's love. Now, how do we do that? Well, simple steps. First of all, we speak to them. We begin a conversation with them. Remember, we've challenged you this year to have spiritual conversations. I hope you haven't forgotten that. I hope you've been able to take advantage of opportunities to steer a conversation to a spiritual conversation to help people. And we're to serve them. We're to put them first. We discover their needs. We practically uh, take care of that need. And I want to give you a great example of something I found out about this morning. I didn't know about this. I, I saw some things going on this weekend, and, uh, and, and I didn't know what happened. Somebody told me about it, but, uh, but this is what happened. Uh, we had our chainsaw crew, uh, a group of, of individuals who went to Wardell, Missouri. That's down in the boot hill. I mean, that's way down in the boot hill. And uh, you don't, you, I don't travel down that area too much, but down there... About eight to ten families received damage last Monday from a storm that came through. Some said it was a small tornado. Some said it was a wind burst. But one of those families was a farmer who lost 17 uh, grain bins. Uh, That was a massive hit, massive destruction. And so uh, I'm going to name these folks out of our church just to help you understand how this is a great example. Brian Sin, who led the team. Joe and Jacob Benning, Lee Baker, Bo and Diane Schantz, and Mike Green. Uh, These individuals went down and uh, they served a group of people, spent the day, and those families were so blessed. 
there's a small church down there. Many of those families go to that church. It was a real encouragement to them. But what happened? They had a specific need, and they did something about it. And they were able to experience not just the love of a human being, but they able to see the love of God. What did Jesus say in John 17? They will know, it, here's a paraphrase, they will know who I am. They will know God by the way that you love one another, the way that you serve one another. So how's the best way to get your life refocused? It's by caring for others. We're so focused on ourselves let's shift it to focus on someone else and I'll tell you what will happen as you focus on others you're going to find your life getting better your attitude getting better your heart getting better some of the circumstances may not change but you'll change and listen isn't that the reason why God allows things to happen in our lives in the first place God's not so much interested in changing the circumstance as he is you. And that's how he'll do it. And as you refocus your life, you'll find the lesson that God is trying to teach you. So let me give you some practical steps. Number one, just let me ask the question, is your life out of focus? Be honest about that. Be honest with God. Yes, it's out of focus right now. Secondly, are you more concerned about you and your needs or others? Again, be honest about that. Are you more concerned right now about you and about your needs than others? Third, ask God to show you someone who you can love, who you can help, who you can serve. Ask him to show you. And then show them God's love. By being very specific and being practical. And I want to challenge you to do that this week. And again, as you do that, I think you're going to find God taking you from here to there. Lifting your eyes, lifting your heart, getting you refocused and finding your life improving, your life changing. And God will bless you as you do that. And listen, you'll be a witness to the world of God's love to them. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right now. There might be somebody who is watching today that maybe you've never given your heart to Christ, that you've never really understood that Jesus Christ actually died on a cross so that your sin could be forgiven. In other words, you don't have to live with the guilt and the shame, the debt that is on you because of that sin. And God is, is willing to forgive you of that sin and of that debt that's paid to him with your life. As you trust Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and paid the debt for you. Now, it's not just a matter of acknowledging that, but it's a matter of turning from your sin and turning to Christ. And realizing I can't do anything to make my life better because I have a sin nature that needs to be dealt with. And Jesus can do that for you this morning. And again, as I said earlier, you can experience a new life. You can experience a better life, an eternal life, by following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may not know what to say or do, but if you'll contact us uh, through the means in which you're watching us today, then you let us know and somebody will connect with you and help you with that commitment. Maybe your life is out of focus. It's because of needs that are going on in your life. And you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody about that. Well, again, just contact us and we'll be able to help you during this time. Even if God is leading you to serve, perhaps, you realize, hey, I need to do something to help somebody else. You're not sure what to do. Again, let us know. And I'm sure we'll find a way to encourage you, to help you take a step to help somebody else whatever else the need might be a prayer request be sure and let us know and we'll help you father i thank you for speaking to our hearts today father for speaking to me in the study of your word realize that it is so easy 
to become introspective. And God, help us to move our eyes off of ourselves onto others because that's where you're working. And by doing that, we're able to see you work in our hearts and in our lives. Father, help these who need to make commitments now. In Jesus' name, amen.